If you've ever played an automation game like Factorio or Satisfactory, you know that beating a game like that can take hundreds and hundreds of hours. Building factories, optimizing, managing your inventory, and growing your factory is incredibly fun, but very, very time consuming. In fact, despite our automation game Atrio being a shorter, lighter take on the genre, most players still take roughly 20 to 30 hours to beat the game. Beating the game in a short amount of time is a serious achievement. I, as the developer of the game, knowing every little nuance and little detail, could only beat the game in five hours. Which is why, when I ran our first speedrun competition, I was blown away at the way these runners took the speedrun to unimaginable levels. This is how speedrunners broke Atrio the Dark Wild's any percent story mode. First, let me explain the game. It's a story-first automation game where you play as a very disposable android, who has been sent to the surface to restore power to the five stations in the region. You do this by automating power production, which in turn lets you expand your light system so you can increase your power production, so you expand your light system, and eventually find and connect all five stations. Now the rest of the video has massive spoilers, so if you'd like to play the game, now's your chance. Still here? Okay, here we go. There are five stations in the world, including your home station of station two, which is where you start the game. For the sake of clarity, I'm just gonna rename them in the order in which players find each station. And you'll thank me later because players very quickly start doing things pretty out of order. But now he gets fast. Oh, now he gets fast travel as well. <gasps> as players find and connect the stations, they'll receive upgrades to build bigger and better factories and unlock new recipes until eventually their base is fully upgraded. Once that's done, the game is complete. Now the speedrun rules are pretty straightforward. You can't use our cheat menu and give yourself infinite resources. Infinite factories, baby. Nice and you have to beat the game. That's it. And to make things easier, I created a speedrun timer that automatically tracks your progress from level to level, and whatever time is shown is your officially submitted time. Now the first submitted run in the competition was by CJ Lim, in what I call the standard run. And although it's not groundbreaking, it really helps explain why the upcoming runs are so special and truly devious. So let's dive in. Here's the standard run route. Each of these biomes has an environmental element that kills the player. If they haven't upgraded their character enough. Blood like electrocutes you, the downtown has strong enemies, and the corrosive zone has toxic air. So a standard run has the player traveling to each station in order and upgrading the player until you're done the game like I intended. And if you haven't guessed already, players start doing things out of order pretty quickly. Let's look at CJ Lim's run. He starts the run by restoring power to his home base. This is where you, the player, build up your first fuel line, set up your first factory, and try to survive your first supply pod. What is a supply pod? Well, each station has a supply pod containing goodies for the player, resources and upgrades and key items to progress through the story. And the best part is it's free, so long as you can survive the creatures that are trying to maim and murder you. So when you visit each station, not only do you have to connect the power, but you also have to beat the supply pods. Once he's done upgrading his home base, he starts section two. The main goal is to discover and automate a new fuel source called Shroom Fuel. This fuel will increase your power so you can expand your lights out to the other stations. But unfortunately, the necessary factories needed to automate mushroom growing are trapped in the supply pods here and here. So, like I intended, CJ Lim does it in order and goes and connects up to station two, fights his way through the supply pod levels and retrieves the planter, and then heads over to the blood lake, fights his way through that supply pod, and then heads back to base where you can start to automate shroom fuel. Lots of shroom fuel. That gives you enough power to reach the iris station. A giant floating eyeball that gives you a minimap because it sees everything. Because it's an eye. Anyway, there's some more automation required, some confetti, some excellently written dialogue. I mean, whoo, just impressive Pulitzer Prize stuff. Woo! And with that, we head into the third section of the game, the downtown. CJ Lamb at this point is two hours and 26 minutes into the run, which is a very respectable time. This fourth station has iron, a base resource to craft electronics and metals. But this river is impassable, so he has to travel all the way around, all the way back, if he wants to move items back and forth. So the challenge is to figure out how the heck you're going to move all this iron back to home base. You do this by using springboards to launch items across the river and back to your factories where you can craft advanced items. Additionally, once you connect to Station 4, you can unlock Fast Travel, which lets you travel to any station that's powered on. This is important. CJ Lim builds out his iron line and after a couple of very unfortunate deaths, beats the supply pod and heads into the final section of the game, the Corrosive Zone. 
Now at this point, you have a little spat with your home base's computer who drops all of your inventory and quote unquote fast travels you to here. Well, also disabling all fast travel. So basically you're stuck rebuilding a mini base, crafting a battery that gives you corrosive resistance and wandering aimlessly in the dark until you find your way out of the zone. At this point, now that you have corrosion resistance, you can connect to the last station. And I am glossing over this section a little bit because it really looks a little more like this. But once you're done the supply pod, you're in the home stretch. Unfortunately, this is easily the hardest supply pod. Not only are you managing your corrosion while managing your light, but the sheer volume of creatures you have to fight is a big jump up from the other supply pods. But CJ Lim makes it through and heads into the end game. The last little bit of gameplay has you automating the most complicated item in the game, a survival kit, which contains water and dehydrated human food. It's, it's confusing, I know, but it just makes sense with the story, so you have to trust me on this. And even though CJ Lim doesn't use any sneaky tricks, he has some good automation design and beats the game in a respectable 5 hours and 18 minutes. And that is our first world record. That is, until 15 days left in the competition, we meet Epiphany, our second main character in this epic story. He's a Twitch streamer and a speedrunner known for his elaborate and frame-destroying satisfactory builds, whose next run starts a rivalry that pushes the speedrun into a whole new direction. With 15 days left, CJ Lim and Epiphany have a race live on Twitch. And outside of generally having cleaner runs, nothing interesting happens until one hour in, where this happens. Epiphany starts placing graph pipes around the supply pod which, if configured properly, completely negates damage to the supply pod. So I looked into it to understand why this is happening, and it turns out, I don't know. I recreated it, and it works properly on our end. I just, ugh. I mean, I'll keep investigating, but I gotta finish this video, so we're moving on. But the reason this is so important is because normally you have to defend your base with walls and gates, which takes a lot of time and effort to set up. But now, Epiphany doesn't have to do that and still can't lose. But CJ Lim has a trick up his sleeve the entangled chest skip. You see that? You see that sneaky placement? Let me explain. This is the entangled chest. You unlock it after beating the first supply pod level, and it lets you access items from any other entangled chest in the world. Here's the impassable river, and here's where CJ Lim places the chest, and here's where the player gets banished with no inventory. So after zooming a screen all the way out and placing it just at the edge of his screen, 30 minutes later, when he gets banished, CJ Lim just casually walks up to the chest that he's pre-filled with his factories and batteries, and instead of having to set up a mini base, he instantly heads off through the corrosion zone. Brilliant. Now, with both runners having figured out the run, well, for the most part, and with some much cleaner automation setups, Epiphany finishes the run with a whopping 434, nearly 45 minutes shaved off of CJ Lim's time. Unfortunately, CJ Lim finishes four minutes faster, 4.30.07. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. A week goes by and both runners are now in a heated battle to get a record, but making no real headway. Until six days left in the competition, CJ Lim smashes his old record. CJ Lim shaves off six minutes and then shaves off another 11 minutes in the early game, but with no clear innovations. But in section three, he introduces a new strategy that saves an additional 41 minutes to the run. And now he is 54 minutes ahead of his old time. Let me explain. Because this river is impassable, the only way to connect to the bulb man is by building this massive line of light bulbs around the river. And you're thinking, but what if you can connect straight across the river? No, bad viewer, I scold you. <laughs> now I'm kidding, our game has a similar mechanic to Don't Starve in that if you're in the dark, you instantly die. And since your flashlight runs out, you'll probably only make it to about here before you die. But that's not all. Fast travel only transports you, not your inventory. So once you reach the bulb man and the iron, you still gotta run all the way around to finish moving the iron back to home base. Or do you? At the very beginning of section two, CJ Lim pre-places all of his automation and light bulbs in preparation for section three. Other runners hadn't done this before because as you can see, he's already nearing his limit of light bulbs. But because his factory is so well optimized for space, he's minimizing the number of light bulbs he needs. And before he even finishes section two, after he reaches the iris station, he continues to the bulb man to save the extra trip. And rather than placing light bulbs, he fits the trip in the dark and has a light bulb line set up and ready to go. All he has to do is connect the final light bulb and in one fell swoop, connects two stations in one go. And using the supply pod protection skip, he can continue to build out his automation line while the battles are running. The multitasking is real. 
And even though section one and two aren't that much faster, it's because he's spending the extra time setting up for section three. And by the time he's done, he shaved off 50 minutes. It's just incredible. And CJ Lim heads into the fourth and final section with, oh, hmm, that's uh, a little weird. Anyway, they heads into the final section well ahead of time and continues to run a super clean 324. Shaving off more than an hour from the previous run and a time that remains unbeaten. Until with one day left, Epiphany submits a new run. Now, I'm gonna need everyone to strap in because Epiphany introduces so many brilliant little optimizations to his run. Like when you deposit fuel for the first time, there's a cutscene that locks the player's input. But right before he hits the cutscene, he hits a checkpoint that overrides that cutscene, saving him five seconds. Or when he zooms his screen all the way out and dismantles all these factories in the dark so he doesn't have to craft them right at the beginning. Oh, and when he's battling through the first supply pod, he leads the pop boxes to this little electric flower patch because when they explode, the damage naturally harvests the flowers. So he doesn't have to spend time harvesting. And we're not even done section one. Look at this. So Epiphany has nine seconds left in the supply pod battle. And I programmed the game so that if you leave the circle, you would have a little bit of buffer time to get back in because it kind of feels unfair to leave and lose that battle. Unless you're Epiphany, I guess. Because while the battle is finishing on his behalf, he just jaunts over to this dropped backpack, picks up some goodies, and heads back. This is so damn early into the game, he hasn't even crafted light bulbs yet. And Epiphany exits section one seven minutes ahead. In section two, he connects to the punk muck, but he doesn't do the supply pod battle. And instead, he heads up to the blood lake. Now, it should be noted, he doesn't have the proper upgrades to survive the blood lake. And he also doesn't have the right equipment to fight the tornadoes. But these little green sections stop you from electrocuting yourself. And after dodging the tornadoes and beating the first supply pod level, he gets four stun bombs. So now he can capture a tornado four levels earlier than he really should. Keep in mind, he still hasn't done station two supply pod, which contains the planter to make shroom fuel. He just, he just left it and starts to connect the iron station and the bulb man without upgrading the player because it turns out there's a planter in this backpack. And I never thought it would be a problem because you're not meant to reach this part 30 damn minutes into the game. Oh, uh, but he's not done. Despite not having enough power, he uses the supply pod skip and just dances back and forth between the only light he has, gets the entangled chest, and then kills himself. Let me explain. The bulb man, which gives you fast travel, isn't powered on yet because he's only 30 damn minutes into the game. And the only active respawn point is back at base. Because he's only 30 damn minutes into the game! You see what I'm saying? So when he does die, he skips the long trek home and is instantly teleported instead. And because he's placed the entangle chest, he can just run over and get the planter and his inventory. Whew. Let me recap. He's only completed section one, but has skipped the supply pod, connected all of the stations, has the entangle chest, and can automate shroom fuel now. And I'd say that's absurd, but he's got more in store. So he finishes section two and section three and is now a staggering 36 minutes ahead of the old world record. But right as he's about to be banished into the corrosive zone, this bug happens again. <laughs> okay, this is what actually is meant to happen. We lock your controls, a cutscene plays where your head explodes, and then you get teleported to the corrosion zone. You're stuck there. But instead, that doesn't happen. His controls are clearly not locked and he's free to run down and open the fast travel menu where he waits. And this well-timed button click sends him to the corrosion zone. So I guess everything's fine. Oh, oh. Uh, okay, well, looks like he's now here, which means instead of being in the corrosion zone, he's here so he doesn't have to do the corrosion zone at all. So I looked into it and it turns out I have no idea what the f is happening. Why is it still working? Ah! Yeah, it's pretty easy to trigger. Just press tap. I no am need able to, to easily no recreate. Uh, well, I figured it out. How anybody, anybody figured out how to actually do this is beyond me. 
And normally I wouldn't explain anything in this grandiose of detail because it's so technical and not interesting at all, but given the fact that I just spent the last eight and a half hours trying to figure out how to do this, viewer retention be damned, I'm explaining it. So the bug happens because of something called sequence breaking. C sharp code runs in sequence. So for example, if I have a function that locks and unlocks the player controls, it will always happen in order. But there's many times when we need multiple things to happen all at once. Like if you're traveling around the map and the game needs to load a section of the world, I'm not just gonna go, oh, her, der, gotta pause the game while I load the level. That'd be a horrible experience. So when you do something, like for example, click a button, it kicks off two paths of code. But if for some reason, a slippery little speedrunner somehow manages to squish this timeline down, things get triggered out of sequence, causing a sequence break. So the bug starts when we click this button and two things happen. One path shuts down the button menu and the other opens up the dialogue. This sequence runs on a timer. It's exactly 1.7 seconds. And at the end, it unlocks your controls. The second sequence loads the story in code, shows it to the player and once done, closes the story and locks the controls for the upcoming cutscene. And as you might have guessed, Epiphany manages to squish this down to less than 1.7 seconds. This unlocks his controls during the cutscene, kicking off the sequence break. This shouldn't be possible for a couple reasons. One, when we fade into the story, it actually locks the controls. And two, the human element of clicking escape takes time. You need to hit escape, wait for the menu to open, and then hit skip. That takes time. But if you click this button, there's a microsecond where you can sneak an input in before the code locks controls. And if you do, it will simultaneously load the story and load the skip menu. This saves you just enough time to sequence break. Altogether, this is what it looks like. Okay, pause, pause, pause. What the heck is this? Well, it's a little bit of game dev magic. When we run a cutscene, we actually hide the player and have a clone that has no functionality. It was just easier to animate and look good in cutscenes, but now that Epiphany has broken out, hitting escape unhides the player and lets him roam free while the cutscene plays. All right, time for the second sequence break. At the end of the cutscene, it teleports the player and then runs this cutscene. But here you are, running around like an escaped convict, breaking all the shit I just carefully built. <laughs> and if you open the fast travel menu, you can trigger another cutscene that takes roughly four seconds to play and then teleports the player. If you do it too early, sure you'll get teleported to wherever you wanted to go, but you still end up being teleported again to the corrosion zone. And if you do it too late, it will close the fast travel menu before you can trigger anything. But he somehow manages to hit the button in that perfect little window of opportunity. And altogether, this is what you get. Now pay attention because the arrow shows you what you're actually seeing, even though two things are happening at the same time. So he opens up the fast travel menu and he waits. And boom, triggers a second flow while the other cutscene is playing. Now we're waiting. The code overrides and teleports the player again, leaving him at the punk monk. So now that he's here and has unlocked the corrosion resistance recipe, he can grab some mushrooms, craft the resistance, and head straight to the deer station to close out the rest of the game. And despite him not having the perfect run, the innovations he's made has allowed him to crush the competition with an earth shattering two hours and 32 minutes like it's nothing. Nearly an hour faster than CJ Lim's previous time. And with less than a day left, Epiphany remains the Atrio world record holder. Until an hour left. That's right, it's not over. <gasps> Dear Lord. This is Anti Elites, a Factorio speedrunner who has the current world record. Oh my god, default settings is dead for now. This is was the most insane run I've ever had, and it didn't die. And he was on one of our vlogs. <laughs> but to be clear, I did not ask okay. him to participate. So believe me when I say, nobody saw this run coming. But I knew I was in for a treat, so I recorded my reaction. Okay, let's start. What's wrong with the screen? Is our game broken? I don't understand what is happening or... No. I know what he's doing. Oh my God. Okay, wait, 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 wait. So what he's done is he's changed the resolution to be so wide that he doesn't need to leave the dark in order to access the backpacks out in the dark. And then he just dynamically changed the resolution. Oh, <laughs> I'm so impressed. You can't even watch this, it's so small. What a sneaky man. Oh, he's going across? Oh, <laughs> he's collecting everything. He doesn't even need to go across the river. 
He's taking a spreadsheet break. Voice over Steven here. So he's using the factories to cheat the supply pod. The top here is Unity's game view and the bottom is the nav mesh. So when I place a factory, it carves out a section of the nav mesh so you can't run through that section. So when you build a fortress, you can't get out, but creatures also can't get in. So because he's extending the screen while these are running, he can continue to work on his factory. I mean, I was using the factory strat, but I was just waiting. But look at him, he's literally building his factory while these work. Okay, okay, oh, look at that. So small on the screen. Wait, oh, and he drags past it. Okay, so because the, the screen is so wide, when he drags his mouse all the way out this way, it keeps going. But we never designed it for that. Like most of the time when you're playing full screen, you can't move your mouse. But he could basically like cheat and build all the way across the map. Oh, uh, this whole widescreen thing is blowing my brains out. Like this must hurt your eyes. I can barely see anything on the screen. This is insane. Does he even need to go across? Oh, he probably does to get the planter. Okay. But now he gets fast. Oh, now he gets fast travel as well. <gasps> okay, I need to explain some stuff. First, because he's playing with like a 12,000 by 10 pixel resolution, but also everything's been done out of order. So he's just completed section one, two minutes ahead. But despite him being here, he's connected the bulb man. And he of course is skipping the supply pod battle here and then proceeds to the blood lake. So you'll notice he's trying to connect the iris station without any power and he's doing this for a reason. Because when he drops this light bulb, it automatically starts the cutscene oh. for the iris station. He just interrupted all the combat, which makes the player invincible. And while the cutscene plays, oh, he's run down the time. Didn't even have to do it. That's absurd. But of course he's not done. Now he's teleporting. He switched to widescreen mode, which means stuff's gonna break. Why is it so thin? That makes me nervous. What's he doing? Now, just to remind you, fast travel drops your inventory and he does not have the entangled chest, but dismantling a regular chest gives you your inventory back. That's how he teleports without needing items. So now he's at the bulb man with all of his items without doing the journey. Creates a factory fortress and builds out his line in complete safety. Now he's done. So that whole time he basically just built while everything else was being blocked by these factories. So he fast travels back to his home base and then heads to the deer station, even though he's just finished section one. So basically he's setting up for the last part of the game, the corrosive section, way before the corrosive section. And we made it so that you, what is he doing? What is he doing? I'll tell you what he's doing. He's connecting the deer station just after finishing section one. And even though he's died, it actually works out in his favor because it respawns him back at home base where he can finish section two and all of section three. And here's his final masterpiece, his chef's kiss. Wow. Because he's connected all of the stations, when he goes to do the corrosion skip, instead of choosing the punk monk, the deer station is available for fast travel. Epiphany had managed to impressively cut out like 75% of the corrosion zone, but anti-elites, oh no, he did screw it up. Did he screw it up? He oh! Just skipped all of it. And he has a clean final section of the run and conquers the HBO speed run competition with a two hour and two minute run. Unbelievable. CJ Lim, Epiphany, and Anti-Elites took a game that should have taken 20 hours and shattered all of my expectations. I had so much fun with this competition that I've decided for the sake of the speedrun to not fix the bugs. So if you want to run, come join our Discord, and we'll see you next time.